Hi, my name is Maria Nakagana Kanuji. I'm Luis Quintanilla. So, this has been the year of AI, and in today's keynote, you saw me leveraging AI in our existing eShop application. And we wanted to demonstrate how easy it is for .NET developers across the globe to easily infuse AI into their existing applications. In our talk today, we're just going to be talking about different layers of AI and how we can build intelligent applications in our app applications today. So Luis, what are we going to do today? Yeah, uh, we could just talk about it, or I can show you. Um, essentially, what we're going to be building here is we are going to uh, be building a bot um, with GitHub issues, right? So you know, GitHub issues is plot where software developers spend a lot of their time, and so uh, you know, you just want to provide an easy way for them to be able to access information that's inside of their GitHub issues. So I was talking to Luis how we should be building an application that works for developers. So Luis, what are we going to be building today? Yeah, so essentially, we'd like to be able to take a bunch of GitHub issues that are inside of our repository. Specifically, we're going to be working with the .NET runtime repo, which has a lot of issues. And parsing through that data may be a little bit difficult and challenging, right? If you were to go one by one and read all the issues, which we do read. <laughs> and, and it's a challenge. And like sometimes the things that I have when I'm going through issues is that you have to look for the issue that you've been mocked in. Sometimes your email can be really overwhelming. And I'm just like, I would love to see this in Teams. Yeah. Exactly. And I think we can do something with that. So yeah, you want to okay. just Let's dive right it? into it. All right. Awesome. So uh, right here, real quick, I am inside of this OpenAI repository, which is uh, full of cookbooks here. You can see this quadrant, uh, chat with issues quadrant, uh, sort of uh, polyglot notebook here. Uh, this is one of the many notebooks that are available here and different samples and recipes that you can use to get started building these types of intelligent applications using AI and LLMs. And so again, I sort of mentioned and alluded to it that I'm inside of this polyglot notebook. And a polyglot notebook is this interactive programming environment that you can use to sort of build out and test out different sort of solutions. Uh, and it supports various languages, C sharp, F sharp, and the .NET languages being one of them. But also, as you'll see later in this uh, talk, it also supports many other set of languages such as PowerShell, SQL, so on and so forth. The other thing that you're going to kind of notice here is that I am inside of the browser, and that is because I am using GitHub Codespaces. So I love GitHub Codespaces. I did not have to set anything up in my machine. And just by launching into the Codespace, I have all of my configurations and development environments set up. So with that out of the way, let's kind of jump in and see how we can start building this application here. So one of the things, or the first thing that we're going to need to build this type of application is a model, right? So yeah. What exactly is a model? Yeah, so a model uh, is like GPT, right? I think in the previous session we were talking about one of those. And the models, what they provide is they do they provide the intelligence, right? And GPT specifically, what it provides you with is a way for to take in user input, and it's been trained on different language tasks, right? So you could imagine things like summarizing information, extracting key insights, that sort of thing is what models allow you to do, and it's what adds the intelligence to your intelligent apps. So um, the way that we get started interacting with these GPT models is one of the ways is through Azure OpenAI, right? And fortunately, we have this SDK that's available to us, right? So we can get started using code and a lot of the patterns and languages that we're already used to. So the first thing we start off, like any sort of project, is by installing the NuGet package. Now, you can see this pound R NuGet Azure OpenAI. So that's the way that you install NuGet packages inside of a polyglot notebook. And so we're going to go ahead and, and install this. I've already, already ran this. You can see that it's got the little green checkbox here. So that means that it's already been run. But if I wanted to rerun it, I can just click the Play button here, and it would reevaluate this code for me. Now, we are go ahead and add our using statements. We add the ones for Azure and Azure OpenAI, as well as .NET Interactive, which is actually the engine that powers Polyglot Notebooks behind the scenes. OK, so the first thing that we're going to do here is we are going to start chatting, right, or try to set up a sort of chat interface inside of this Polyglot Notebook so we can interact in a natural language interface with our model here. And so the first thing that we're going to do here is we're going to configure our credentials, right? So you probably saw it. We're not using regions for this one uh, because I don't actually don't know if you can use regions inside of Polyglot Notebooks. No, you cannot. OK, all right. Well, we'll have to work on that <laughs> feature request. Um, so we're going to configure our credentials here. We're going to get our key, our endpoint for uh, Azure OpenAI. And we're also going to have a chat deployment. So this is the model that we're going to be using here to uh, you know, add intelligence to our application. 
And in this case, what model are you using for the people at home? Yeah, so in this case, we're using GPT-4. So that's one of the latest and greatest models from OpenAI. And so that's what we'll be using for this demo. In this case, uh, so we're going to configure the client here. The other thing that we're going to do is we're going to configure our chat completion options. Now, these are a set of parameters that you configure in order to let the model know what exactly you're, uh, you know, you're looking to get out of. So let me kind of walk through a few of these here. So the deployment name, that's the chat deployment that we have. So pretty straightforward there. And this would be the deployment name that you give the chat in Azure. Exactly, exactly. So when you launch this in Azure, it's that same name, right? And so this is how it knows which model to pick from. The other thing that you're going to see here uh, is this max tokens. So a token, you can think of it as a way to split up text, right? So the way that these models typically work is they work on predicting the next best word or their most like, next most likely word in a sequence or in a piece of text, right? And so the way that these models process data is in these to using these tokens, right? And you can, not exactly, but a way to think about it is a word is equal to a token, right? And so in this case, we're telling it, here's the max number of tokens that we want to use as part of our chat interactions with this model. Now, <clears throat> the next thing that we have here is this variable called temperature. Now, temperature. It, yeah. Is it hot or cold? Well, um, it's depending. It depends. Everybody loves that answer. So, <laughs> so it depends on what it is that you're looking to get out of the model. So I guess if we were to use that analogy, if you were saying you want something that's hot or you something that's, I don't know, out there and very you know, creative, um, you might want to set this temperature value to high. So it, I think the range goes typically from 0 to 1. And so one would be, I guess, hot, and you know, you, you might have it write prose like Shakespeare or something like that, right? You want to get the creativity out of the model. But in this case, we don't really want it to get creative with our GitHub issues. We just want it to give us the information. So we're gonna, you know, it's gonna be cold, it's gonna be a little bit boring. Uh, so we're gonna lower that temperature down to zero. And it's going to produce more reliable answers. Yeah, so that's the same thing that those who have used Bing Chat at home. It's where you have from precise to creative. This is like setting the temperature to exactly be precise. Exactly, exactly. I actually like that analogy. I'll probably use it next time. Um, the other ones are just different parameters in terms of, you know, should it try to find different words if the words have already been used? So it's controlling things like that. But the main ones that you want to look out for are the tokens and the temperature. OK, so, so far, so good. Um, we're, we configured our client, we configured our options to uh, provide information to our model here. Now, another piece that we need to provide here is the system prompt. And the system prompt here, if you can see in the code here, we're defining that as you are a helpful AI agent that helps users get information about their GitHub issues. So you're giving the AI a persona. Exactly. I'm giving it a persona and a job, right? Because I think in the previous demo, I was seeing how you can sort of tweak this prompt to uh, sort of uh, change the behavior of what this bot is supposed to do. And so in this case, we're just strictly trying to constrain it to help us with GitHub issues. And that's its job. Um, OK, so once we have that configured, we're going to add that message as the first message inside of our chat history. And so chat history is a way that you can kind of think about if you were interacting with somebody, right? So if you are having a conversation with someone, you know, we're going back and forth here having a conversation on this demo. And we don't reset after every turn. No, it's setting context. Exactly. It's setting context. So every time as you continue this chat, uh, the, you know, in the conversation, it's going to use it as context to continue the conversation if you ask follow-up questions. But the very first message here that we're setting in our chat history is the system prompt, the system message that defines the behavior of the agent. And at that point, we're going to use this uh, good old while loop to just get her, start a loop. Um, and one of the things that this loop is going to do is it's going to get my prompt, so the inputs that I give to the model. Um, it's then just going to go ahead and add that to our chat history. And then it's going to use the get chat completions async to call out to op Azure OpenAI and get a response back from the model. Once that's done, we're going to add the response to our chat history because, again, we want to keep that context of the conversation, and we're just going to output the message. So if I were to run that here, uh, let's see if you have options. Oh, whoops. Let me just kind of tell you now that it's kind of live here. Let me just kind of set this up and rerun some of these. All right. Do our client. Do that. This one, start the chat. 
All right, so let's start it up again. Okay, so now you can see that the prompt showed up here. And I'm just going to say hi. You can see that the first message there is you are a helpful AI agent. And then once I send my message, it comes back and responds, hello, how can I assist you with your GitHub issues? Okay. All right. So I think one of the things that I'd like to know is if there's been any feature requests. So let's see. Maybe dependency injection? That, that could be a good, good feature request. Let's see. Uh, are there any feature requests uh, for dependency? If I could type. All right, and you can see that now I sent this to the model. And we would expect to get a response back relatively soon. OK, so the response here is saying, as an AI agent or as an AI, I don't have access to real-time access to GitHub's database. So I think this kind of goes with the previous conversation about sending your data to the models and whether your models have your data. And I think this pretty clearly shows. It doesn't. Exactly, exactly. But there's something that we can do about that. How are you going to do that? OK, well, I mean, we're going to get there eventually. But I think the first step is let's actually just get the GitHub issue data. OK. So let's go ahead and get our issue data, uh, GitHub issue data. So in this case, um, we are using this library here, OctoKit library. We're configuring our client here to get the, uh, the you know, uh, to get our client for GitHub. Um, at this point, we get the labels because we want to be able to also categorize or actually uh, have the label be attached to the issue, right? So we have additional information that the model can use to generate the responses. And so in this case, we're getting the labels. We're also getting all of the issues, right? So that's happening there. And you can see that we have about 4,000 issues. Here, we're getting about six months worth of issues. So I think that should be enough to right. get started. Um, and at this point, we'd like to sort of shape that data in a way that makes more sense to us. So I don't want all of the data. I just want to know the title, the actual description. Hey, there's the area there. So we want to also have the area. And we want to have the URL so that if we need to reference the actual issue and we want to go into it, we have that information as well. So again, we're just mapping the original data that we get back from the API. And we are just putting it inside of this GitHub issue record. And we just have a set of helper functions in case we you know, lose data. We can just save it to a file and reload it back. So nothing, nothing special happening here. OK, so now that we have our issue data, yep. we like to be able to query it. So let's go ahead. All right, let's do it. So we're going to take some of these issues. And we have a helper function here called naive search, for lack of a better word, which is going to take our query. It's going to take the GitHub issue data that we just um, collected. And it's going to set a limit. I just want to see the top. Uh, sort of issue here. And typically, you know, if you were searching for something in a piece of text, whether something is contained in a piece of text. You'd look for contains. Exactly. That's what you might use. And so we're, again, this is a very naive search. We're just looking at the text of the GitHub issue and asking, is my query inside of that, uh, of that text? Right? And then we're just returning back the results. And so we can see here that if we call that function, again, here's our query. Are there any features for dependency injection? Well, yep. it's empty, though. It is. It is. Um, let me see if I can kind of tweak this query and actually get a result. So the main thing here, right? We're, let's take the feature request out of the picture. We care about dependency injection and whether there's anything that mentions dependency injection. So if I just put that and I do a naive search, OK, there's an issue. Yes, because it's doing keyword search. Exactly, exactly. Um, and if we were to put it back, we can see and we run that, it comes back empty because it doesn't know the semantic meaning of the query, right? It just sees, is this piece of text word for word, right? Is this keyword present in my text? So is this where things like vectors become important? Absolutely. You're spot on. It's, it's almost as if you saw what was coming next. <laughs> <laughs> um, let's see. So we have, OK, so now that we know that keyword search works, but it, you have to be very precise into how you craft your query and you search for information. Let's try something else. Let's try embeddings. So for those at home, what exactly is an embedding? So the TLDR version of this is the embeddings are a way to represent text as numbers, right? More specifically, it's an array of numbers. Yeah. And so one of the cool things that um, you're able to do with these numbers is as you'll see later, you can actually operate math on this, right? And one of the math operations you can apply on these embeddings or these float arrays is something called distance measures, right? And you can, the distance measure, what it will do is it will try to determine how close or how far apart things are. So things that are 
more closely related. So in this case, for example, issues that were related to dependency injection would have a smaller distance and would be closer together, semantically speaking. And you know, something that was not related to dependency injection, the distance would be further apart, and so they would not be related. So cosine similarity. Yep, that is definitely one of the, one of the metrics we can use here. Um, so one of the other things that we're going to be doing here is, first of all, we're going to set up some of these uh, records to help us structure our data. Um, you see the, the word chunk here, and I'll just talk about it briefly, and I'll, then you'll kind of see what it does. But if you remember earlier, we talked about tokens and how there was a max token or a token limit. right? And so these models accept up to a certain number or can only process a certain amount of tokens. And so we need to be efficient with what we get the model, right? You cannot you know, uh, throw in, um, you know, uh, the entire Harry Potter series, for example, um, at one of these models because it's just way too big and it wouldn't be able to process. You very quickly run into that token limit. And so a way that we get around that is by creating chunks. And a chunk is just splitting up individual pieces of text, right? And so processing those individual pieces one at a time to make sure that we're not hitting some of those token limits. Um, okay, so in that case, now that we have these data structures, these records, we just go and generate a new collection of issues with chunks. Okay, And for the time being, these chunks are empty because we're actually not doing any processing. Eventually, we're going to populate this here. <clears throat> so uh, we are going to actually be using an embedding model here. right? So specifically, it's the Ada model from uh, Azure OpenAI service. right? And that's what's going to take our text and turn it into an embedding right? or a float array. Okay. Um, we have some helper functions here, where, which we can also use, again, for persistence. Now, here's where we're going to actually go through the process of chunking our data, our GitHub issue data, and then generating embeddings for it. And to help us do that, we're going to use this AI utilities, which is just um, a package that just contains some helper functions that help us with the chunking and also with uh, uh, you know, some of the token generation. So you're going to he see here this tokenizer. right? This is, uh, this is something that's provided here by the uh, AI utilities package. And we're using this Ada model that you see here. And what this tokenizer is going to do is it's going to break up our text into tokens. Okay, So that's what it's going to do. And then we're going to go through each of our issues. In this case, we're not going to go through all 4,000. We're just going to take a few of them. And we're going to go and go through this loop. And one of the things that we're going to do is we're going to um, chunk our data. And we're going to do it by token. And we're going to have a, an overlap. So we're going to pass in the full text of our issue. We're going to split it. Every so every three thousand tokens, or roughly every three thousand word, words, and we're going to have an overlap of about fifty tokens, right? So, the reason for that is, you know, it may be three thousand dollars. Sorry, three thousand. <laughs> well, it right. could cost three thousand. Yeah, it could, yeah, three thousand words. <laughs> in this case, um, you know, it's an arbitrary number, right? And so, it's very possible that one of the sentences may be cut off, and you're going to lose some of that context. So what the overlap is giving us here is exactly that, that just in case we arbitrarily cut off a sentence or something that was relevant to that chunk, we're, we're sort of compensating for that. Um, at that point, we're just massaging the text, right? So we have the title, we have the area, and we have the actual text here. And then what we're doing here is we're chunking, not in a different kind of chunking, but we are essentially uh, creating a collection of these chunks so that we can batch process them using Azure OpenAI. And so that's kind of what's happening here. Once you have these chunks created, you're going to go through each of them, and you're going to call this get embeddings in sync and generate the embeddings for them. Okay? And then at that point, we're just adding it to that chunk collection. So that's all that this is doing. And then, we're again, we're just saving this. Now, <clears throat> what does this actually look like? If we take a look here, this is our GitHub issue, and this is all the data that was available for, uh, for us. But if we kind of scroll to the right here, right, you're going to see that there is this embedding. Okay? And that embedding is the float array representation of the text. Of the text, exactly. So here's one of our chunks, and here's the embedding representation of that chunk. Okay. So let's kind of keep going here. All right, so now we have the embeddings for our GitHub issues. So maybe we should just try uh, searching. OK, so let's see the accuracy this time. All right. So there's going to be a few more things that we're going to have to configure here. Um, so I'm going to install the system numerics tensors package. Um, and one of the new APIs that we shipped with .NET 8 is this 
uh, sort of tensor primitive set of APIs. And these tensor primitive set of APIs give you some functionality to be able to work with these vectors or these embeddings, right? So these float arrays. And in this particular case, um, we are using the cosine similarity um, API or, um, or, or method here. And all it's doing is it's taking a float array, our embedding, so it could be our query, and another float array and measuring the similarity between them, right? So that's what this tensor primitives is doing here. Um, and we're also doing it in the context of the similarity compare, which is just one of the other utility uh, sort of uh, functions and functionality that the AI utilities is giving us here. So at that point, we are going to set up an embedding search async helper function here. And what this is going to do is very similar to how we did the naive search. It's going to take our query. It's going to say some data. In this case, it's now this, the issues with the chunks and the embeddings. And again, we're setting a limit for this. So we just take the top spot. Now, the first thing that we're going to want to do here is, remember, we're not comparing keywords. We're not comparing text. What we're comparing are the embeddings. So we already have the embeddings for the GitHub issues, but we don't have the embedding for our query. So we need to be able to take our query and um, you know, generate an embedding for it so that we can then compare it against the embeddings of all of our issues. And so that's what's happening here. So the first thing is, we are calling back get embedding async again. And you can see here that, uh, yeah, we're just passing in our query. We're getting the embedding vector for that. And then we're trying to get the search results of that query. So we are looking through our chunks. We're using the score by similarity to where we're passing our embedding vector to our query. We're using the similar compare, which again is using that uh, tensor primitives cosine similarity functionality to make the comparisons. And then we're comparing the embedding of each of our chunks. right? So we're going to see how does our query compare to all of our embeddings. And at that point, we just order by descending because we want the ones that are closest or the most relevant ones. Uh, we also want to set a threshold so that we can see, like, OK, well, after this, you know, if it's any less than 0 0.5 in terms of similarity, um, just discard it, right? And then just taking that. So if we were to ask it the same question, are there any feature requests for dependency injection? You're going to take a look here. And then you can see here now that I didn't have to do a keyword search it actually was able to understand my query. Because it looked at both the query and the embeddings that were coming back from the issues. Exactly. And, and more importantly, the semantics of it were still sort of maintained and persisted here. OK. Um, let's see. OK, so let me just kind of scroll down. So question yes. is that you've had all this information. That's great. We have to store this data somewhere. We do. Um, and I think a database would probably be a really good place for it. But it, it's not just any database, right? In this case, we need a vector database, which I think in the aerial talk was uh, alluded to. Right? Now, in this particular uh, example, we're going to be using Quadrant. Right? And so uh, Quadrant is one of the uh, various vector database uh, providers out there right? uh, to, that allows you to store these uh, embeddings. Um, we've actually been working with the community to actually, let me just scroll down a little bit more here to show you this Quadrant client. Yep. And that's available today. That is available today. So you can go on NuGet, look for Quadrant Client, and take a look and uh, download it, start using it. Um, you can actually also use Milvis. We've been working with the Milvis community as well. And they also have a, uh, you know, a C Sharp, a .NET client available. So you can download that one on NuGet as well. And you can also, it's milvis.client if you were interested in that one. But in this case, we're using Quadrant. Now, <clears throat> one of the ways that I can sort of get started with Quadrant is by just running it locally. Um, now, one of the things I mentioned are polyglot notebooks. We've been running C Sharp so far, but one of the really cool things about polyglot notebooks is you can actually run multiple languages. And you can see here in this case, we're actually using PowerShell. So same notebook, uh, but using a different language here. So we run this. This is going to run and stand up a sort of a, a quadrant instance for us locally. And then we can just begin the process of getting our data from our in-memory collection and storing it in quadrant. And so Again, nothing particularly uh, interesting happening here. We're just you know, adding the using statements. We're initializing our client for Quadrant. Um, we're creating a collection. In this case, we're uh, calling GitHub issues. Right? Um, we're creating our collection because we don't have it available uh, right now. And then we're just mapping our in-memory collection to this uh, point struct, which is the data structure that Quadrant is expecting the data to be in when you insert into the data. And then we just call upsert async, and then we're able to get this data stored in our database. Perfect. OK. But sanity check, I want to make sure that I can actually search with Quadrant and actually access the data that I just entered in there. So 
Again, by this point, you've seen many different search functions. In this case, we're using search with quadrant. It's taking our query again. It's taking the collection name this time. We're not giving the data directly because the data is already uh, in our database. And we're doing very much the same process. So we're generating an embedding using uh, Azure OpenAI for our query. And then we're giving that query to Quadrant and saying, search async. Here's the, uh, the vector for my query. Go find me the most relevant results. And then eventually, it, 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 you know, it comes back with the results. And if we were to run that very same query, are there any feature requests for dependency injection? You can see that it comes back with the results. And so this is running, uh, this will be running inside of our database. Oh, it's so running in our database inside of Azure. Mm -hmm. Yep, exactly. Yeah, um, you can actually deploy Azure, uh, sorry, Quadrant to Azure. Um, you can actually stay tuned because at Ignite, there's going to be a lot of really interesting announcements happening uh, around deploying some of these vector databases. So yeah, stay tuned for Ignite and uh, learn more about that then. OK. Yes. So I love this. Yes. Right? And I think this is amazing. Notebooks are a great place to learn, a great place to experiment. I build Polyglot Notebooks and .NET Interactive. Yeah. But when I think about building an AI bot, I think about running it in a chat environment. Yep. And I did mention Teams earlier. OK. All right. Uh, you're right. So this, in its current state, will not run in Teams. But I think we have the building blocks. And actually, I think we can use something else. Because one of the things that you may have noticed is, well, I can search and get my data. You can chat. But those pieces haven't really come together. And so one of the things that we can use for that is Samantha Kernel. OK. Yep. All right, so let's kind of switch over to Visual Studio. And let me kind of just uh, show you here real quickly what my solution looks like, kind of close a few of these. So uh, we have a set of applications here. The main ones that I kind of want you to focus on are this API service, which is a minimal API. Um, we have the Teams app, which is actually the application that enables us to talk to Teams. And we have the just front end web application built with Blazor, right? That is just, if you had a web page for your bot or anything like that, or your application, that's exactly what that is. And we have actually, I don't know if it's a, it's a verb yet, um, but it, we've been, it has been aspired. We, it's been aspired. It's been yes. aspired, yes. It's been aspired, right? And that's kind of what you're seeing with this API service and app host. So let's kind of start at the high level here with Aspire and show how the different pieces sort of integrate. And then we'll delve, delve deeper into the individual pieces that make our, up our application here. That's going to eventually go on Teams. So. Um, if you can see here, let me just make this a little bit smaller. So this is our application host for Aspire. We have our builder, which I think folks have seen in the various demos here. We have our API service. Now this API service is, again, this is where the logic of uh, our sort of bot or the, the, the AI application that we're building lives. Um, and you can see that we're referencing this API service both inside of our um, sort of uh, web application built with Blazor, and we're also referencing inside of our Teams app. And so that's all we need to let Aspire know and let our entire solution know that these, these applications, our web and our Teams app, depend on the API service. Okay, So I mentioned that the API service is the one that contains all of our logic. So let's take a look at what this looks like. So again, I mentioned it's a, it's a minimal, uh, minimal API. And we only have two endpoints here. We have the, yeah. Yeah, so it's an API that looks like any other API that any developer has built. Yeah. But I do see there's an SK chat service to this. Yep, exactly. Yeah. So let's kind of go through that. Uh, you're going to see that real quick. Uh, before we dive into the chat service, um, you're going to see that all it takes, it's a query, right? And we're calling this ask questions async uh, method here or handler. Uh, so let's take a look at the, what the SK chat service looks like. So. Whenever you hit the chat endpoint on this minimal API, it sends your user question. And then in this case, we're actually using semantic kernel, this semantic text memory, which we've configured uh, all the way up here. right? Um, and so we're using that to do a search async. Now, one of the really cool things that semantic kernel gives is I mentioned that you, know, you could use Quadrant, you can use Melvis, you can use Azure uh, Cognitive Search. right? The choice is yours. The thing is that they have different APIs. And depending on which one you're using, you're going to have to learn a different API. And so yeah. Semantic Kernel provides that nice abstraction that you just learn the Semantic Kernel, uh, kernel API. And you know, for the most it part, it handles all exactly. the other levels of abstraction yeah. for you. So otherwise, a developer would have to write all those by themselves for every single service, every single AI service they want to use in their application. Exactly. But you want to know something else that's really cool. Um, the semantic kernel connectors for different memory providers like Quadrant, like Milvis, they're actually backed by the same SDKs that we just showed you earlier. So, wow. Yep. Okay. Yep, exactly. So, in this case, we are calling the search async. 
we are passing our user question. Now you might ask, how come in this one, I am not generating the embeddings? Yes. Well, Semantic Kernel is actually doing that for us. If I kind of go up here real quick, um, when we actually, uh, let me go back to program.cs. Here's where we're configuring our memory. Here's what we're saying with embedding gener generation. So here's where we configured what it needs, what, what Semantic Kernel needs to generate embedding for us. So we don't have to do it. Which we had to do before when exactly. we're using the AI utilities package. Yep, and, and the SDK specifically, yes. Um, so, so yes, so Semantic Kernel is handling it for us. We're just passing in the user question, doing the search, and it's handling everything for us. Now, <clears throat> one of the things that you may have heard, uh, whether in this session or in, in other sessions, is this pattern known as retrieval augmented generation. Or RAG. Or RAG, exactly. And that's actually what's happening here, right? So this part here where we're getting the, the relevant documents, that's the retrieve part. We're retrieving relevant information that's going to help the model answer a question. Our user prompt, or the thing that we're submitting to the model, is exactly that. But we're augmenting the prompt that we're sending to the model with our search results and our documents, right? And that's kind of what this is here. You can see that there's our item, um, our text data. And then once we've augmented our prompt, we then uh, just generate the response, right? And so uh, that's, that's basically it. So what we'd expect to see here is whenever we launch this service, hit the chat endpoint, and we're going to generate a response using the documents and our, uh, from our, well, using our GitHub issues. OK, <clears throat> so far so good. Last part, and we're almost there. So for our team spot, the only thing that we need to do, um, the team spot is actually um, this application that's going to be handling our message. So <clears throat> whenever uh, this on message activity async uh, sort of method is called, uh, it's going to grab the text from the user. Uh, in this case, it's going to be in Teams. So whatever message that you provide to in Teams, it's going to pop up here. Um, and then at that point, uh, it's going to call that chat endpoint, right? So in this case, we're sort of uh, doing string interpolation, interpolation so that we don't have to manually input um, our base URL. But it's hitting that chat endpoint here. And it's, it's, it's just doing a po sorry. It's just doing a post request. Uh, <laughs> it's doing a post request to that chat endpoint with our message text yeah. that we got from the chat application. And then it's just returning the response back to the chat application. So that's it. That's all it took. Most of our logic was inside of that minimal API using semantic kernel. Um, and now it's just the matter of integrating into Teams was just calling that minimal API. So I think we're ready to run this. So is this going to work? Well, I don't know. We'll have to figure it out. <laughs> so let's see. Let's start to run this app, try to run this application and see what happens. Uh, no, I would not like to start Docker Desktop. And we can see here that our application is launching. So there's our API service in Aspire. So yeah. far, so good. They're all starting. Uh, there's my Teams app, and then there's my front end. So we'll give it a second here for all of our applications to get started. And then before we head to the Teams application, one of the things that I want to do here is I would like to just test the API service individually you know, by itself. So if we go over to the endpoints here, it's going to launch us into the Swagger UI, which I think, you know, if you're a developer, you develop uh, these sort of web services. Familiar, right? All right. So let's try the chat endpoint and try to ask it the same question. Uh, are there any feature requests uh, for dependency? Okay. And if we were to execute that. Give it a second here while it's thinking. And while that's thinking, what I think is really important to note here is developers are just adding little snippets of code into the existing applications. Mm -hmm. The real change in your code base this time is semantic kernel, and mm -hmm. it's only to make things easier. If we looked over at our notebook code and we compared it to our application code, we can see the ease that mm -hmm. semantic kernel provides you. Otherwise, you'd have to be writing and doing all that embedding and chunking on your own. But the semantic kernel does that for you. So we have the results back. We do. And I mean, I think that this looks pretty good. Property injection. Uh, so yeah, I mean, this looks you know good enough. And you can see here that it's returning the title. It's returning the URL and the summary of that issue. So not actually returning the issue, just a summary of it. And that was the model doing all the work here. All right. So we're down to the last few minutes. So let's see the star of the show. OK. All right. So let's see this in Teams. So first of all, let me go to the front end. 
And in the front end, you could imagine if you had an application, right, that points to wherever your bot, like kind of we saw earlier in the keynote, right, we had our bot sitting alongside it. In this case, though, we're just showing it that this is working here. We're going to go over to Teams here. And this is going to launch us into this experience. And it's going to tell us, do you want to add the .NET Runtime uh, Teams app? I'm going to add it. And it's going to give it a second for that to launch. Now, you know, not so secretly, I was testing this before, so I kind of it's, it's, it's OK. Like, we always <laughs> want to make sure that we're getting grounded results. So we are glad that we tested this ahead of time. We, we tested it. Okay. So now, moment of truth. Is it going to work in Teams? I am a little bit lazy here, so let me copy and paste. OK, perfect. And so it's going to go. And let's see. OK, my bot, it's writing. Yeah, so like it does have like that cue of it feels like it's coming from a real individual. Yep, and hopefully it doesn't ghost me. Um, fingers crossed. Let's see. All right, so there it is. And so you can see that uh, you know the same responses that we got back from the minimal API. Now it's being used uh, inside of this Teams application. Can you click on the link? Because I want to make sure we actually are hitting a dependency injection issue. Okay. Um, okay. It is a dependency injection because remember we were actually using the label to have that information about where this area belongs. So uh, there's the dependency injection label, and you can see if you were to read through it, and if you wanted additional context, you can sort of you know look through this. But it took a long time. It did. Okay. All right. Let's actually go back to our Aspire dashboard here, and let's actually take a look at the traces. Okay. Let's see. So this one's being flagged here. It took 16 seconds. Let's see what's going on here. OK, so we can see here that um, our team spot, a request was made. And then it hit that chat endpoint on our API service. And this was actually the part that took a long time. And if we were to expand, it's just a little bit more. Oh, I guess I can't. But OK, that's fine. One of the things that you can see is that the operation that took the longest was actually calling GPT-4. Exactly, exactly. And so from here, you know, I would have additional information as to how to debug my application and how to you know, uh, you know, do what I need to do to improve this performance. Great. So what we've learned here today is that we went through a notebook to show all the different concepts that you would need to know when building an AI, integrating AI into your application. We also showed you how to infuse AI into your existing work stream. We added no additional new tools except Aspire to Aspire yep. it, and you got up and running. But let's go through different areas today where you can learn more about AI. Yeah, so you can see the whole list of them here. Um, there's a ton of great session. You know, uh, John and Scott kicked it off earlier today, and then you know we went. But again, throughout all .com, there's a lot of really great sessions happening. If you want to learn more about some of the Teams AI capabilities, right? Uh, the folks are going to be presenting on that, and then you learn about semantic kernel, generative AI in general. So whatever it is that you're looking to learn uh, with Scott Hunter, you're going to learn how to scale these types of applications, right? So. Make sure to tune in and check out the other session. But uh, we're not done. We want to kind of show you and point you to this resource here, aka.ms slash AI.net learn. So if I were to kind of open this, just go there. All right, you're going to see that we have this really great collection that has a ton of great samples, like the generative AI enterprise chat template, um, which is how you can implement this similar solution, right? But with security and all the things that an enterprise would need. We have eShop, which you actually saw earlier today. Um, we have the cookbooks, which I kind of talked about earlier, and I was in that repo there. Um, we've got a ton of learning content. We got the beginner series. Um, we have blog posts. So whatever it is that, that you're looking for, you can go to this resource collection and find it there. Perfect.